Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Felipe Vargas with us today. Hey, Felipe. Hi, uh, Frank. It's very nice to, to be invited here. Well, it's super nice for you to agree to talk about your very lovely article, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, Felipe, where, where are you located at? I'm currently in Morelia which is one of the campi of uh, UNAN, mm -hmm. which is located in Mexico City, mm -hmm. in Mexico. So, yeah. And it is uh, June 29th of 2022 as we record this. And so I imagine that summer is in full swing in Mexico City. Yeah, it, it's kind of rainy, but yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that when Mexico City gets its rains is in the summer? Yeah. 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 So yeah. they have like this rain that goes always in the end of the afternoon mm -hmm. and, but mm -hmm. like you have a, all the day of sun and then comes the rain and the end of that boom washes it all clean <laughs> makes yeah. it a little human it's the same thing here in phoenix uh we do get this is our rainy season is in the summer is when uh the rains come so in that sense it's kind of like mexico city we get that gulf gulf moisture gulf of mexico mm -hmm. coming up right yeah same thing mm -hmm. yeah very cool um and your cat walked away before you went on you had a cat behind you there. yeah actually i have two cats one i brought from brazil cool and another one we adopted here so we have a brazilian and a mexican cat <laughs> so <laughs> yeah uh, cool. one is called mileva einstein <laughs> nice nice very good very and cool. the another one is huki very cool very cool <laughs> so, so you're a you're a brazilian native yeah, yeah, I'm Brazilian. I'm cool. from the south of Brazil, close to U Uruguay. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Very nice. Uh, Felipe, what do you like to do for research? I, I mostly uh, do simulations of high energy objects. Uh, mm -hmm. And I am focused on supernova, mostly interacting supernova. Ah. Yes, rich, rich topic these days. Uh, okay, and uh, before we get into the actual article, I think you have a couple of items you want to share to sort of motivate uh, where the paper was coming from. Yeah, so uh, my article, or our article, is about a very interesting supernova. Mm -hmm. So the supernova 2014C um, was first classified as type one supernova, which are yeah. supernova that don't present hydrogen lines. Yeah. And uh, that's a picture from a paper of Mili Sav... It's a Scandinavian name, I don't know. How Milosevic. Milosevic. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So here uh, we can see that uh, at first we only had the uh, emission from the host galaxy. And then you see that uh -huh. the supernova uh, start emitting, uh, so that the H, H alpha line starts increase. Uh -huh. So that so that's a very interesting supernova. Indeed. Some people uh, call the chameleon supernova because it's changed the changing, changing the, look supernovae. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the chameleon supernovae. Uh, it's called this way because it changes from type 1 to type 2. Mm -hmm. So here also we have more evidence of uh, later interaction. So that's a supernova that started as type 1. Then the shock wave starts interacting with the median. And then the, uh, so the, that's why it started to emit the H alpha line. Got it. And mm -hmm. then here we have a mission that was well modeled by Maguti. Mm -hmm. we, uh, it was well modeled by uh, Brim Strallon uh, emission, which it's like a strong evidence oh. that it's an interacting supernova. So that's the motivation for starting to study the supernova. Very cool. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ article. It's open access, people. It's free. Get it. Survival of the fittest. Numerical modeling of SN 
2014C and Felipe, take us away. So to summarize like the title and the subject here, we call like survive of the fittest because we use a genetic algorithm to try to model the supernova 2014C. Mm -hmm. So so the supernova, as I as I told you, is a very interesting object because uh, like it changed its type and showed uh, signs of strong interaction with the median. Yes. Uh, so the supernova, it's uh, it was discovered by the Lick Observatory, mm -hmm. and it's in the galaxy NGC seven three three one. Yes. Around like. 14 and 15 megaparsecs away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, mm -hmm. the, sh so the, the shock wave of the supernova started to interact with the median. And uh, <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. I'm a little yeah. bit nervous. Can you edit this part? <laughs> keep going. Keep going. It's all good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So we got a, we got a forward shock, and we're going to start interacting with the. Um, and it could be you know material that was ejected by the star itself at an earlier stage, or it could be you know some close in ISM kind of stuff. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the the models for the supernova are that. It might be um, an unsta unstable star, a single unstable star that okay. e ejected its material before collapse, like a Wolfram or uh, uh, LBV star. Uh huh. Yep. And or it it could be. Um, uh, I started that had a companion and ah, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. due to tidal interaction, it lost its outer layer. So it's this kind of study is very interesting because uh, uh, as the shock wave of the, the star moves much faster than the material and the environment, yes. you can, uh, I, I'm gonna quote one of the co-authors, which which is Rafaela Marguti. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use uh, this kind of stuff as a time machine to study material that was on the progenitor before collapse. Ah, right, right, good. Because because uh, of the interaction with material that was there before, and now it's much slower than the shock wave. So uh, I'm with you. I think I think we can have to figure one. Let's go to figure one. So we're going to use a genetic algorithm here, and figure one will get us rolling. Okay. One. Okay. So here we show the density profile and in mass coordinates of the progenitor and the ejecta mass. So what we did in this work was okay. we had two simulations before collapse and after collapse. Uh, not not bef uh, before uh, the shockwave uh, left the progenitor and after the shockwave left the progenitor. Got it. So, so we, we did the, in two parts because the second part was the part we are going to apply the genetic algorithm. So here we have the, the the uh, ejecta mass in orange and the progenitor dense profile uh, in mass coordinates in blue. Uh, uh, yes. So okay. the ejecta mass is the part of the material that's going to leave the star and interact with the medium. So the idea here was we did this first simulation and just when uh, the shock wave was leaving the star, we stopped it. And then we t took this uh, less uh, output from the first simulation okay. as an input for the second set of simulations. Got it. So in the second set of simulations, we, as a first approach, we tried to 
just uh, modify the parameters of the uh, material on the medium. Okay. But it was very hard to fit with observational data. So we run like 2000 simulations and we, and we are trying to reproduce the ob observational data. So what mm -hmm. we did was we ran a, a, a code called Mescal, which was created by my supervisor. Cool. And it was a hydrodynamical code. And then I created a, a okay. radiation transfer code. Uh, so I, I would run the radiation transfer code as post-processing on the outputs of Mescal. Got it. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Then I would compare the emission from the simulations with the observational data. Very good. So the problem we had here was that although we, we had many and many simulations, like 2000, we couldn't find, we couldn't fit the data because it, it appeared that the, the circumstellar material which was much more complex than we could like uh -huh. imagine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why we thought Oh, maybe we have to take a new approach. Uh, so this approach was, we, we are trying to find something that would change the, the circumstellar material. And uh, so without our bias and let it evolve alone. So we applied okay. the genetic algorithm. Okay. So here is this part the radiation transfer code. Yep, there you go, transfer equation. Yes, for, so it was focused on Bremistralum because it was the yeah. part that was interacting. So, mm -hmm. and here we have, we talk a little bit in the figure two, we talk a little bit of uh, the genetic algorithm that is the most interesting part for me. <laughs> okay, let's talk so, about it. So what we do here is that we have uh, the um, density profile that's variable, okay? Mm -hmm. So we take this density profile and we modify we modify them we modify it with mutation and crossover. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's like the biological idea of the uh, Darwin theory. So we treat the parameters of the environment as genes. And yes. we mutate them randomly, uh -huh. as nature would do. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why the the paper is called "Survival of the Fittest." And then, okay, we set a number of simulations, we mutate them, then we compare these mut mutate uh, mutate sim simulations, and and we also do something that's called crossover, which mm -hmm. is we take parts of uh, of randomly selected simulations, and we and we use them, even though they are not good, because that avoids something called uh, on on biology elitism, which is like we f you find a, mi a local minimum, and your simulations can't evolve because it will be stuck there. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. so we do so. So that's mainly to, to have uh, diversity. So diversity is very important for evolution. So what we do here, we, we, we take, uh, for instance, 100 simulations and we choose the 10, uh, the 10 best simulations. Right, we hit some minimum. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, compare, like we choose them by comparing with the observational data. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes. with this, uh, so we take a fraction using random, a, a fraction of the next generation will have randomly selected uh, genes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or density, uh, like uh, density profiles. Mm -hmm. So 
we m maintain diversity, but like almost half of them, we we use like mutations of the best ones of the last generation, yes. and we repeat repeat this process uh, many many times. So if you could you zoom out, uh, 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 sure. So the next figures can talk a little bit more about that. I think. Okay, let's just look at figure three. So, figure three. So that's how simulations evolved. So we use a. Uh, uh, you could use the any wow. function for comparing, but we use a key square function. Yeah. To mm -hmm. compare the data. So what happens here is like in the blue lines we have our the best key square of each generation of simulations yes. and the worst okay okay so when uh the line for instance when the blue line is straight uh there you yep. would have some elitism so that that's why it's important to have diversity so you you can keep the simulations evolving right it's stuck in a local minima here <clears throat> yeah ex exactly uh-huh so uh as generations pass by you can see that the uh key 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 squares are converging yes and then when we reach uh, uh around 150 uh <laughs> simulations it's like the the changes on the profile are really subtle all right so yeah. We let it evolve a little bit to, to, to be sure that it's like oh. uh, stable and it's not going to evolve anymore. Right. And we took this last uh, optimized solution as a density profile for the supernova. So the, okay. the novelty here is that we let the environment evolve on the simulations on its own. So we are not like imposing anything. Cool. Oh, very nice. And in figure four, you can have an example of how that evolved, you know? So you have generations uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the right side. Uh-huh. And the... the radius. Oh, very nice. Okay. So you can see how the, yeah. how the simulations evolve from generation to generation to you, you, mm -hmm. we reach the optimum solution cool. so it was like the the changes from 150 to a thousand simulations were uh, generations were subtle mm -hmm. so that's more or less the result the blue the blue profile is the result we have in the end nice very good okay so uh I like that shot. In figure five. Let's see, figure five. Here we're gonna propagate the shock through the progenitor wind and figure five. And there we go. So uh here we can have like um in the in the second panel of mm -hmm. this figure, we can see how the shock wave evolved in the environment. So you had the uh, like a normal wow fed winds or and then the, the shock wave came and started interacting Bang. and and at the distance of uh 1.8 10 to the 16 centimeters yeah. mm -hmm. right about here you have you have you have this big shell that caused all this brimstone emission yeah. and in the third panel you can see, uh, like you have a zoom of this density profile you have there. So this this part, got it. Where, so this first part where, where you have these curves uh -huh. are where you had we had data. So we could compare with something. The part that like are okay, where is written no data. Is because we didn't have data, so we couldn't compare to anything. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but like we have a, an idea of the mass of this shell because of the absorption. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. And um, uh, 
and very cool fi figure six so here we have the evolution of the shock wave on the first panel and uh yes we also put the data from vlbi to because they have an estimation of the uh, uh, position and velocity yes and we could compare so we it's a little bit different although some parts are inside of the uh error mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, really earlier on mm -hmm. uh -huh. but that's why we have to explore as well some we are going to explore in, in the next papers cool. uh, like progenitors and uh, different progenitors and stuff like that you know so Clunky. but what mm -hmm. it was a very good approximation of the yeah will be a data yeah and yeah. also uh if you can go can you go to this big figure i have <laughs> above uh above no, below, below. Below. Yeah. Uh, figure seven. There we go. This one? So, yeah, here you can see uh, the evolution of the shock wave in the first panel interacting with the this dense shell. And okay. the thick line is the... Uh, the ejecta and the thin line uh, is uh, the material of the the shell ah uh, okay it's the CSI. Uh, yeah. okay got it uh-huh i'm with you uh-huh so that's how uh it evolved there and i think a very interesting figure to show the comparison between observational data it's one uh, uh below that i show it's another figure i think uh -huh. it's nine Oh, there we go. There's some observations. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm gonna shrink that a little bit. Okay, yeah. So these two figures show the comparison with observations. Mm -hmm. So cool. th that that uh, with wow. like the little stars. So th the little dot stars are the observational data, mm -hmm. and there. then that's what we were comparing with uh the result of our simulations to select the fittest you know okay good so uh they are separated by uh some constants so, so only to yeah. see them right right so uh -huh. we have the offset uh-huh uh -huh. so you have the density flux or by energy here and mm -hmm. we so we compare the emission from from the simulation, which is the continuous line, with the the observations, mm -hmm. and that's how we chose the fittest. So the thick line is our best model, okay. which uh, and the 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 uh, the uh, got some dotted lines uh, there. Yeah, the dotted lines are the same, but we changed also the opacity of the environment. So it would change the absorption. Yes. So if the okay. medium was ionized, the cross section would change. Yes. The medium. Uh huh. I'm with you. Uh -huh. Yep. And if, uh, so we changed that okay. to, to find the best fit. Uh, uh, as well, yeah, and the continuous line it, uh, is a how it it would be a continuous R to minus strip of profile. So, okay, uh, we, we are showing here that even though it follows an average R to the minus strip profile, you need these bumps or this complexity to yes. try to uh fit the data uh-huh so and on on this figure what is the uh what is the gray band calling it oh, to? oh the gray band it's uh iron emission so you have a peak uh, that yeah okay uh-huh so, uh -huh. that's why it goes up yeah 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 
and mm -hmm. we are not trying to fit that so we didn't consider the iron emission on the data mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you, you can see all all of iron emissions much higher than the lines but we are not trying to fit the iron emission so fair enough very good cool oh uh, so uh the idea of this paper like was trying to fit a very interesting supernova with maybe uh, for me at least a very interesting approach which yeah. was uh, uh using a genetic algorithm to try to model the, the environment and we are uh so we we, we found the density profile mm -hmm. and we had i i mean it's not perfect because for instance we consider uh spherical symmetry and we run 1d simulations okay so uh but it was a very good approach and uh, in the future we intend to run to these simulations and consider other effects for this supernova and mm -hmm. other supernova so very cool very cool nice work Felipe, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article. Uh -huh. And you touched on a little bit there at the end, so I'm gonna I will push on that a little bit. Uh, so so where do we go? Let's say in the future over the next two to five years, are there additional uh, BLBI observations that could be done? Are there other wavelengths that could be done? So you do a multi wavelength approach on certain things. Um, is there? You mentioned a little bit of additional modeling. Uh, you know. Uh, perhaps taking going from 1D to 2D or 3D, <clears throat> or uh, I think what you're doing here is you're, you're fitting uh, you know, a, a, uh, a density profile. So sometimes in these um, material that comes out, it's clumpy, it's lumpy, it's not always the same density. So are there maybe some efforts going on the way to model a clumpy uh, circumstellar material? So just kind of where do we go over the next, let's say two to five years? So we, we have, I have been working on considering much more uh, physical stuff in general mm -hmm. for the next uh, simulations. Yep. And uh, for instance, I have uh, I have added cooling, uh -huh. uh, yeah. photoionization, mm -hmm. recombination, yep. and many other physical uh, physical. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the on the problem, so we could uh, uh, study different objects or even the same. And not currently, I have been working on two papers that are going to be ready for the end of the year. Cool. And one of them is changing the profile. Uh, the profile. It's it's a set of many 1D simulations trying to represent a, a, a 3D model. Okay. So we, we don't have mixing, but uh, we are going to use these simulations to try to approach to 2D and 3D simulations. Right. Mm -hmm. And also we uh, we want to make this study considering the the physics we're added already on the code for the same supernova. So good. We, we will have more two articles about this subject. Awesome. Well, I look forward to seeing those articles toward the end of the year or early next year. <laughs> very great. Thank you. So it's a it's a novel approach and it's pretty cool. Very good. So thank you once again for walking us through your article, Felipe, and that'll do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better, and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.